Dr. Ani Kalajan. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on this program of Mindful Leaders Inherited Legacies. Ani, you are a psychotherapist. You are a trauma expert. You are author of several books, also journals, uh, articles actually. You've devoted your life to understanding the impact of trauma and to uh, you've undergone also a journey of healing through forgiveness and meaningfulness. What's interesting is that you founded an organization called Meaningful World, which is an association for trauma outreach and prevention. And you've helped many, many people through workshops, through programs, through classes, through concerts even, to find mental, spiritual, physical, and even emotional health. I'd like to start, Ani, with um, understanding who you are, more about your family history, so we know that you're from Syria. Your family, your forefathers are from Kilis. Yes. Right. Yes. So your Both sides. Both <laughs> sides, both from your mother and your father. Yes. I'm going to turn my attention to the story of your father. Your grandfather, your father's father, was a soldier uh, in the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman army. And at the time of the genocide, his Turkish friends told him that he should flee. He should not even go back home he should do whatever he can to escape. He adamantly and stubbornly says, no, I need to go. And the missionaries gave him a ticket to America. Right. So he could have gone, right. but he stubbornly said, I need to go back home to say goodbye to my family. And so he arrives to Kilis, sees his entire house burnt down. Now I'm, I may be butchering the story a little That's bit, all right. but the, he comes and sees his entire house is burnt down by the Ottoman Turks. Yes. And surprisingly, he sees also and he finds out that his wife and his son of two years old, your father, was actually hidden uh, in a Turkish neighbor's basement right. to be protected. Somehow, I will, I will get to the story, but they actually arrive, they escape, and they get to Syria. Yes. I'm correct, right? Yes. Now, you... They live in Aziz. They live in Aziz, right. Now, Ani, you... Uh, and I'm, I'm not even touching the story about your mother. I just want to point out that you grew up, and you mentioned this, you grew up never knowing anything about the genocide, neither at home, neither at school, because in Syria at that time, talking about the genocide was actually uh, it was forbidden, censored. was yeah. censored. So you grew up nothing, but you say that you've always felt something off, right. something that was not right, yes. something bad had happened to your people. Now, how do you, how can a child articulate that? Or how can an adult looking back at their childhood, knowing that they felt something, what were the experiences or the actions from your parents or your family members that made you think that something very bad had happened to your family? Mm -hmm. Could you tell One me One thing is that they were all wearing black. They were mourning. They but were, you don't know that as a child what that I means. I didn't know, but I, I guess the vibration of the black and their sadness gave me that impression there was something wrong. And they would always look at the newspaper to see if they could find lost uh, relatives, relatives from the genocide. And I always was very inquisitive, but they kind of brushed me off to protect me. And they said, go study. So that's how I was always the first in my school. Studies, <laughs> yeah. But you, you always sensed that. You, the, and and also, the, the, also uh, another struggle was the human rights violations in terms of like gender. I am like sandwiched between two brothers. Right. Uh, three years younger, three years older. Mm -hmm. They could do everything like play outside, ride a bicycle, mm -hmm. but I couldn't do any of those. So you always felt so you you felt that growing up. But then in your mid teens, you and your family fly and move to the U.S. Yes. Here you are in this foreign land already, uh, trying to settle yourself. You don't know any English, and you undergo another kind of trauma, which is the bullying. You are targeted of harassment, bullying, uh, and discrimination because your non-Armenian student friends or, or classmates actually describe you as stupid because you cannot speak English. You cannot articulate what you want to say. So they immediately actually think that you're stupid or a degenerate or terrorist. Some, terrorist. Because I'm from Syria yeah. or 
communist because Armenia was Soviet at the time. Right. So, I mean, for a child to go through these very different stages of pain, of emotional burden uh, from the family or the household to even a new country, to trying to adapt to a place where it's, it's not your language, you don't speak the language, to how, tell me how you persevered. What, and I, I want personal experiences of what helped you uh, go through a certain sense of reverence and, and achieve a certain level of peace. And that, I'm going back in time, obviously. We'll come back to your how you mm -hmm. developed your career. But this is the moment that's actually very poignant for me, that right. how does a person actually try to transition and transform their pains mm -hmm. at a young age? Uh, it was a, a long journey. The beginning was um, I was kind of forced by my mother to be understanding of my two brothers. They would do charutune and, and you know mischievous things. They would pull my leg and they would uh, uh, push me around and stuff. And she would always say, you have to understand them. You have to understand them. They don't know any better. I'm like, I'm done with this. Uh, why don't they know? Uh, why am I responsible to know and to understand everything? But then uh, it seems that that nurtured my trying to understand people and trying to help. So when I... But you went into nursing first. Yes, I so went to nursing, nursing to help people. To help people. And also at that time, uh, because I didn't know the language, although I uh, got high school diploma, but I didn't have the proper counseling to get me to um, a four-year school. So they said, oh, go to a two-year school. Mm -hmm. And in two-year school, what can you do? I thought I'll do nursing, then I can work at nights and then get my doctorate, which is what I did. But then I was discovered when I was in the two-year school by four-year school, Long Island University, and they saw my grades and they gave me tuition and grants. So I was able to go to four-year school and then Columbia University so that I worked at nights as a registered nurse so I can do my PhD. Did you always feel that there was some kind of a gift in you that you wanted to go and I, I people use the term calling um, I don't want it to be a calling in terms of function or a role did you feel that there was some kind of a pull or a nudge in you that you should go into uh, psychotherapy psychology helping people what was it is it was it an instinctive emotion was it a a, a sense of you know needing to be uh, perseverant in your life to address what what was that inside of you that actually pulled you to come and take this this route yes uh, i i mean i would uh, be i'm delighted that you mentioned gift i would not call it a gift i thought it was a need around me that people needed help and I needed help because I went into rage when I found out about genocide. I would go with the, um, the um, uh, Armenian revolutionary groups to uh, in front of the UN, uh, be revolutionary, yell and scream and want our lands back and so on. And, and that really, you know, really didn't settle well with me. I had digestive issues because that anger and frustration was causing physical harm. Was causing me physical harm. Um, and my mom had emotional issues. My dad had emotional issues in terms of struggling in a new country and things like that. And uh, my mom married at 15 and a half. Uh, uh, my brother was born. Uh, at six, uh, when she was 16. Um, so uh, she never had a childhood. She never had a, and then she had postpartum depression. They didn't know what that was in Syria. So that the whole thing and the, this whole Armenian uh, genocide and people always being in anger and sadness, anger, rage and sadness. I thought I need to help. I need to help myself and help them. Mm -hmm. I couldn't help them without helping yourself. Me. Yeah. So that's you, how. Usually, psychodynamic systems um, 
there's a, a branch of psychodynamic systems that is focusing on clinical paradigms. And that basically uh, falls on the premise that we, um, every human act has a rationale. Yes. Every action, even if it's an irrational action, there's, a, there's, there's an explanation to it. And that our human development, including intra and intra, uh, inter and intra relations, is actually a byproduct um, of our past experiences. Um, you discover later on in life about what happened with the genocide. You undergo a certain sense of anger, frustration, trying to make sense of and make meaning of this. And you also realize that it's hard to be able to find peace, especially when you know that to this date, the perpetrating government has still not acknowledged this atrocity, this genocide. So it's very hard for us to actually think about healing or forgiveness when you're still feeling like there's this burden on our shoulders and on our hearts that, you know, there's no acknowledgement. Oh, How? yeah. And it went uh, beyond that where I was invited to a conference in Istanbul and they threatened to kill me, the, um, the meat, the, the Turkish, organi Turkish, uh, Turkish KGB. Like. Oh, the KGB. Yeah, Turkish. When meat. did this happen? Uh, 1999, right before their uh, ter uh, tragic, really bad earthquake. So the conference was in June, and it was, <laughs> very funny to say, on human rights. Oh, how interesting. Psychotraumatology and human rights. But the conference organizers is uh, International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. I was the president of the New York chapter. So they had invited me to present. We had just done the research on the survivors who came right. out of the, uh, yeah. The uh, many interviews that you did of the actual survivors of genocide, which yes. was also published in the journal. Um, of the trauma and stress exactly. studies. Yeah. And it was the first scientific research that was published uh, on that uh, topic. So uh, um, they censored it. They said, instead of genocide, I would say mass human rights violations. In, instead of Ottoman Empire, we will say perpetrators. Instead of Armenians, we would say survivors. So it was really mm -hmm. all... Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's also an experience that you actually go through that, is, that causes a lot of very negative emotions that comes also from fear. Oh, trauma. How did you, how did you process that? I was having that? nightmares. Tell me about that. I was having nightmares because they threatened if I tell anyone about it in America, they would kill my brother. They mentioned my priest brother's name, where I'm staying. They knew everything about you. In, in uh, 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 Yeshilko, uh, which is, you know, a, a suburb because Haran Tink was helping me at the time. And uh, he said, uh, uh, try to not stay in the hotel where the conference is because they may uh, find a way to steal your passport and then they will stop you. You From don't traveling. have a passport, they'll put you in prison. Once you're in prison, we cannot get you out. So I stayed in the suburb and uh, every day they came and threatened me that I cannot say the G word at the end. Uh, it was the last, uh, at 4.30 on Tuesday, my presentation, the organizers and the president of the ISTSS, who's uh, British, they came to me, they said, I'm sorry, we have a situation here. And I said, okay, no, no, we have to go downstairs and talk privately. We go downstairs, there are five uh, Turkish police by the office, we go in, they say, the government has threatened the organizer who is professor in one of the major universities. And they threatened that they would take her professorship and fire her. So they begged me not to say the G word. And I freaked out because at that time, every day the threats made me have diarrhea, fever, like when you're traumatized, you felt, you felt the complete your physical immune system and... shuts down mm -hmm. because I'm fighting the threat. Mm -hmm. And my immune system was just, you know, I was suffering extremely. So I said, what do you mean? Uh, this is a human rights conference. You're telling me what to say, not to say. I can't deal with this. Um, so they said, okay, then here, you, you have to sign this letter. The letter said, I refrain um, mentioning words that are controversial in this country. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to sign and I 
really was extremely furious. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't have my lawyer with me. And plus, I have diarrhea, I have to go to the bathroom. And I ran out and I'm trying to find a friend in the lobby to help me what to say. I found two people, I said, please follow me to the bathroom. They came and I said, this is the situation. They were like, it can't be, this is a European conference. They begged for this to happen in Istanbul. You, you, and please give me some practical tools. They said, okay, okay. You say mass human rights violations. I raise my hand and say, oh, do you mean the genocide? genocide? Yeah. And you're not saying the word. You just say, mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, you say uh, perpetrator and the other one from Netherlands would raise her hand and say, do you mean uh, Ottoman Empire? I would say, mm-hmm. Right. So right. we orchestrated this like a kindergarten, uh, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. uh, theater. And I went down and I said, okay, I'll sign. As long as you give me a copy, I signed. And I said, what am I gonna do with my overhead transparencies? Because at the time it wasn't PowerPoint, it was transparencies. So uh, they said, no problem. You go to audiovisual lab, they have black markers and they will really, you know, cover all the, com you know, controversial words. So I did that. We got all the blacks on Ottoman genocide, Armenian, etc. I came to the, my presentation, and who's introducing me? The British president of the ISTSS. And he went like reading my whole almost CV, emphasizing my United Nations connection and humanitarian work. And then at the end, he said, we thank Dr. Kalajan for refraining uh, using words that are taboo or mm -hmm. controversial, right, I think right, he said. Right, right. So I'm just, I'm just, um, I'm just imagining like uh, the, the slew of emotions that you're going through. But in, here you are, you're actually trying to teach healing through forgiveness. Yes. How do you get to that, honey? <laughs> well, <laughs> the, but you the, know, this, this, it's a very difficult process and it's not one day that you actually understand what forgiveness means. How does one practice forgiveness even if you know that you've undergone so much stress, physical trauma, you know, how do you do that? Right. So um, my, um, really gratitude is to Viktor Frankl. Frankl, from yeah. this man's from search for meaning. Man's search for meaning. He's an Auschwitz survivor. All his family, including his wife, wife died. And his pregnant I wife. took a course with him and when he came to America. Um, and I told him, we had just finished the research with the genocide survivors. survivors. And when I asked the genocide survivors about the denial, they started cursing these good old mesmamas, babiks and dadiks. They started cursing and of course. The, 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 rage. the rage. And I said, how can I help my community with this rage and anger? And what does he, he tell you? He looked at me and with his Viennese heavy accent, he said, you have to help them forgive. And I looked at him and said, how do you forgive? Nobody acknowledges it. He says, how long do you plan to wait? Hasn't it been long enough? enough? And it light bulb yeah. just blew yeah. right there. And yeah. I said, that's right. Why are we waiting for our perpetrator? They, if they had that consciousness, they would not do the act anyway, and they would have acknowledged it of long course. ago. Of course. We have to acknowledge one another. I started large healing groups. Then I started Turkish, Armenian, Kurdish healing groups. I was just all over. Armenians were throwing rotten tomatoes, eggs, you're crazy, you're traitor, you're uh, asking us to forgive, you, your parents must have not suffered. But Ani, it's understandable. I mean, there's, uh, when you yeah, still- I understand. It's understandable rage. about the, the anger, the frustration, uh, because not everybody has that moment with a Fr Victor Frankl or any other, let's say, opportunities to actually turn the gaze within ourselves. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh actually says we have to learn compassionate, you know, listening. We have to allow people's pain and anger and frustration to come to the surface, allow them to go through a transformation process of healing because everything that's bad, there's a learning process that comes with it. But how do you actually 
tell a mother who lost an 18-year-old child during the war in Artsakh to say, you have to forgive. It's, you can't just say it. You know, it's something important, that Important, yeah, but one important, very important thing, Viktor Frankl is not uh, naive. Uh, you have to heal the pain first, the trauma, before you can get to any level of forgiveness or compassion. That's why we're in, uh, unable to get to compassion here or empathy. There is very poor empathy here. There is a lot of judgment, a lot of rage. Well, you see that also with the people being so toxic. You know, a lot of people are just, you know, attacking their uh, uh, people outside to blame their anger, their uncertainty, their fear blaming it to others, pointing fingers to others. It's right. the government, it's my neighbor, it's the this political party. So, I mean, that there we haven't had for centuries with after all these different traumas, had had a way to collectively heal that energy. Well, those are the symptoms what you're talking about are exactly the symptoms of trauma. Pointing the finger, look how many fingers, fingers are, are pointing, pointing at me. Right. We have to be responsible. Managing emotions is my responsibility. My emotions is my responsibility. Yours is your responsibility. And how would you do that? What, were, what are the practical tools? You've, you have these in the, the seven steps of, of the Forget Me Not book. You have many of your articles that have been published that show how to do that. But for a person you, you're sitting with for 20 minutes, what would you do to help that person, I don't know, have some sense of hope or lightness or just awareness. Yes, uh, 20 minutes or an hour is enough to help the people to release because if you all have the poison, you're never going to get into peace and in healthy state of equilibrium because our body and our consciousness has its internal wisdom to help us bring into peace. But when we have all this poison, both um, energetically, um, historically, generationally, horizontally, we have the traumas individually. Let's take a step for a moment for that, because this is an important part. You mentioned, even this was new to me, for a person who studied transgenerational trauma, um, five specific traumas, apart from the collective, apart from the individual, apart from the transgenerational that comes from, from generations, the vicarious, you know, me as a doctor listening to the patient, that kind of right. vicarious. The fifth one is what you call horizontal learning, which was you Violence. described the crab effect. Right. Tell me what you mean by that. Do you think we as Armenians have many of these different traumas? Yes, we have severe horizontal violence. In fact, everybody that I talk with, we've been doing like at least 15 workshops in 13 days we've been here. They say, oh, that's in our DNA. So they just accept it as face that's value. That's our illness. That's our DNA. Because it has gone, we have been, the, the psychology of horizontal violence is that, um, oppressed groups, nations, small nations they like that, us, that, that, that Palestinians, us, Sierra Leoneans, Haitians, mm -hmm. uh, Congo, Cambodia, Cambodians. And Cambodians, and every country we've been in, Sierra Leone, they say it's Sierra, Sierra Leonean disease. In Haiti, they Haitian insist disease. it's a Haitian disease. Yeah. So it's a, a and, and uh, black Americans in America, they feel it's black on black violence. Mm -hmm. But the psychology of it is that when you are oppressed for centuries and the oppression is from top, bottom, and the your frustration, frustration and, and the anger blows up, blows up, there's nowhere to go up because you're continuously to you. Outside. Horizontal. Outside. Who's next to me? Me, my, my friends, own brother and sister, my, siblings. my friends, my nation. I am unconsciously with my hatred, with my jealousy, with my disrespect, with my rage, with all of that, I'm putting one another down. The crabs in the bucket uh, comes from uh, blacks that live in southern part of America. And the crab, crab, bu bucket crab is basically when the crab is trying to go up out yes. of the bucket. Yes, second one. The other one is it pulling down. them down. Yes. So you. I, I'm, I'm, it's very sad that I don't have more time to sit with you because what you're saying actually resonates a lot with me as well. Um, but I just want to share this um, for people to know that this is not the first time you've been in Armenia. You've actually come with Meaningful World before. But since this the earthquake. Since the earthquake. And you and your team come and actually conduct various workshops, but not only in Yerevan, all over the regions in Armenia. 
Now, this time though, you've returned after this 44 day atrocity, still fresh, still people have not really processed any kind of meaning making, um, including myself in many, in many cases. And you've taken more than two weeks to go from very different uh, institutions and crowds and, and public uh, speaking to talk about this. What have you sensed this time that's different from the past? What have you felt in people that, that you're teaching your, your seven steps and the meaningful living and healing? What have you noticed most and what has been your biggest challenge? Right. We have every workshop we have been, uh, which has been over 13 workshops, uh, people and all ages from children of six to eight years old to 70 years old, we have seen people have expressed a lot of grief, of a course. lot of uh, anger, a lot of uncertainty, mm -hmm. a lot of fear. fear. Yeah, those four feelings. How do you help but people? But now uh, you're saying it's fresh, but it is six, over six, seven months now. And it's time for us to find mass healing ways for us to discharge because according to the scientific research after a trauma, uh, if it passes six months, it goes into chronic, mm -hmm. it goes into really re a, a much more complex mm -hmm. trauma, which will take much more time to heal. So I call on everyone to find ways to use the seven step. We're putting books everywhere in every, at the university. At you have the, your website, uh, Meaningful World? We have World. a website, yeah. MeaningfulWorld.com. Uh, we're gonna put it at the Bookinist right. bookstore mm -hmm. for people to go and buy them. We have them at the university, uh, Yerevan State University. Uh, for people to reach out to us, we're gonna do weekly Zoom meetings, right. support groups. Mm -hmm. Um, Saturdays at... Uh, You're also teaching also other psychologists, other yes, doctors, so that they can course. also perhaps tra translate that and disseminate that in, you know, here in Armenia. Exactly. Yeah. So the real uh, true um, uh, growth and transformation for Armenia is to integrate emotional intelligence learning into the curriculum starting from the kindergarten all the way to high school, because once you learn it at a young age, then you will suffer less. Mm -hmm. You will have the tools mm -hmm. to deal with things. Now we don't, uh, I see very poor uh, approach and very poor, uh, uh, very few tools in Armenia, even psychologists. How odd is it for a population or a nation that actually, or ethnic group that has undergone so many layers of different traumas? Right, but so. this is what happens. You know, Palestinians, for example, suffer the same way because it's compounded trauma. They mm -hmm. kind of feel like they don't have enough time to heal. And then we kind of stop at the expression and then uh, maybe we get a little empathy, uh, not much, but the law they try, but we don't go to the next step. The next step is learning something that you specifically uh, benefited from this uh, situation in terms of as a person, how did you cope with this situation? What specific uh, meaning you got? Because every uh, trauma shocks and really changes the meaning of life even that we had. Mm -hmm. it, it makes you examine it uh, anew and you start building new ways of thinking. A lot of people when I ask about meaning, they talk about material, my house, my uh, family, uh, the people and material. We have to go beyond uh, what Viktor Frankl talks about is uh, having values. Mm -hmm values of lifting one another, helping one another. At the concert that we had at Arami uh, Aiki, uh, we, I, I, I challenged everybody and said, uh, not just say that, yes, you want to lift people up, but wake up in the morning and say, okay, who am, am I going to lift 
of today? Or what what my, kindness what am is I, my intention going to be for the day? Exactly. What kind of kindness I'm going to do today to my fellow Armenians? I'm going to the I'm, rage and the hatred has increased. It, it, of course, it has increased, and we feel it also from the relationships that people have with one another. So Which is very normal because is, after trauma, is. if you don't heal it, you're going to turn it either inwards, yeah. start drinking more, addiction, and, addiction and abuse or hurting others. others. That's Ani, I want to, uh, I don't know how to end this because really I could sit here for, for another hour with you. Um, unfortunately, I will bring this to a close and we I have a quotation to share. I, I would, you have a quotation to share? Yes, our uh, motto in our uh, meaningful world is when one helps another, both become stronger. So it's not like I'm here helping. I am also pulling receiving. myself with my country, with my hiring, with my people. Well, I hope you come back soon again. And despite the fact that you will have virtual um, sessions yes. and webinars, and I encourage people to actually check out your, your publications, your books, and, and your website, I do hope that you'll have a chance to come back again this year, not, uh, <laughs> you know, and um, we'll, we'll definitely have a chance to, to talk again. Dr. Ani Kalajan, I want to say I'm very happy that you took the time to meet with me. I failed to mention that you're also a certified yoga instructor, which is actually very nice that we're doing this, this talk at Arev uh, Yoga Center, Yoga and Pilates Center here in Yerevan. So I'm very, very grateful for your time and for your inspirational thoughts. Thank I you. I am grateful as well. Really grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you.